Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us online for today's reading and conversation with Jamil John Kochai and Karen Mahajan, celebrating Jamil's short story collection, The Haunting of Haji Hotak and Other Stories, which I hope you will grab a copy of. My name is Lily Philpott. I am the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event space. A quick visual description of me. I have short dark hair that is pulled back, round glasses with dark frames. I'm wearing an orange shirt and large silver earrings in the shape of a fern. This event is taking place across multiple time zones, so please do say hi. Let us know in the chat where you're watching from. I am speaking to you today from Brooklyn, New York, where I am on ancestral and unceded Canarsie and Mansay Lenape land. I want to acknowledge the custodians of this land I'm on today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. For those of you who are new to the Asian American Writers Workshop, we are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian and Pacific diasporic literature and storytelling. We hold frequent readings and conversations like this one, organize community arts programming in New York City high schools and senior centers, run fellowship programs for emerging writers of color, and publish an award-winning online literary magazine called The Margins. You can find out more by visiting us at aaww.org or following us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, where the recording of this event will be posted. I also want to make sure that I note that you can purchase copies of Jamil's book via the link in the chat, and I very much hope you will do so. During this event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. We are going to open our event with a reading from The Haunting of Haji Hotak, followed by conversation with Jamil and Karin, and then we'll have time for audience Q&A. So please start thinking of your questions and submit them via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I am going to briefly introduce our speakers and then we're going to welcome Karin on screen to introduce Jamil and then Jamil will read. Jamil John Kochai is the author of 99 Nights in Logar, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award for debut novel and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. He was born in an Afghan refugee camp in Peshawar, Pakistan, but he originally hails from Logar, Afghanistan. His short stories and essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Plowshares, and the O. Henry Prize Stories 2018. Currently, he is a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. And our moderator, Karen Mahajan, is the author of Family Planning, a finalist for the International Dylan Thomas Prize and the Association of Small Bombs, which was shortlisted for the 2016 National Book Award won the 2017 NYPL Young Lions Fiction Award and was named one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2016. In 2017, he was selected as one of Granta's Best Young American Novelists. His reporting and criticism have appeared in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker Online, and other venues. And he teaches at Brown University. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for being here and please join me in welcoming Karen on screen to introduce Jamil. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Um, I'm gonna offer a visual description of myself. Uh, I'm a brown man with black hair uh, wearing uh, a salmon shirt. Um, and I'm based in Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> Um, it's a real honor to be interviewing uh, Jamil Jan Kochai today, who is one of the most astonishing talents in the firmament of American literature. I remember being blown away when I read his first novel, 99 Nights in Logar, which effortlessly combines the voice of a pious Afghani Muslim with a rebellious sack down slang. But this collection that you're going to hear from today takes that project one step further by combusting the storytelling with formal experiments and a furious magic realism reminiscent of Gogol or Kafka. This is a world 
where you're likely to meet weeping goats, praying monkeys, and of course, the odd uh, Pashtun fuckboy. Like Salman Rushdie and Hanif Qureshi, Jamil takes supposedly clashing markers of identity and throws them into generous and surprising conversation. And it's safe to say, despite the gallery of uh, luminaries I've just name checked, that I've never read anyone like Jamil. Um, we're now going to hear him read. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Jamil John Kochai. I'll start by offering a visual description. <clears throat> um, I'm a brown man with short black hair. I'm wearing a gray speckled t-shirt, square shaped glasses, and earbuds. And, and I have a short black beard. Uh, so before I start reading, uh, I just want to thank the Asian American uh, Writers Workshop uh, for hosting this event. It's an organization that I've been following for a long time, and so it really means a lot um, to sort of have my first debut event with them. I think it's such an important organization, and hope that you know everyone continues to support them. And then, um, and then also, you know, um, uh, incredibly uh, honored to be able to speak with Karin here today. Um, you know, I, I read his uh, book, The Association of Small Bombs, years before I'd had any contact with him. I thought it was absolutely brilliant and. You know, for me, I actually think it's one of the it's one of the best books, defining books of the 21st century. Um, so so again, you know, total honor. And, and finally, I want to thank everyone who who showed up today to to hear us speak. And um, it, it means a lot to get support. Um, so I'll start off by reading a short passage from uh, one of my favorite stories in the collection, uh, The Tale of the Lee's Reversion. Um, it's really beloved to me because uh, it's based on the story that my grandmother used to tell us um, when we were very little um, that, you know, if we crossed the path of the Johnny Maz, the prayer rug, while we were, while someone was praying, we would turn into a monkey. And it's something that I very, very uh, much uh, believed at the time. And so, uh, so this story sort of is based upon that. Uh, uh, so uh, it comes from my grandmother, God rest her soul. <clears throat> the tale of Dolly's reversion. Shakoko Jani was praying Fajr beneath the makeshift shrine she had built for her two martyred brothers, Fahim and Kadim, when, at approximately 6.45 a.m., Dali Abdul Karim, her second-born son, crossed the path of her Jani Maz and promptly transformed into a small monkey. And although, as she would later recall, Shakoko did not see the transformation, her eyes fixed upon her Jani Maz, she did hear the cracking sound of seven English rifles being fired from somewhere deep within the Black Mountains. And because she knew that the Black Mountains were 8,000 miles away in Logar, and that the last of the English rifles in Noe Kale had sold for 100 pieces of cornbread in 1982 during the worst months of the massacre famines, she realized that the cracking sound she heard was not of death, but of a different sort of reversion. Thus, Upon finishing her prayer, Chakoko knelt forward, picked through her son's fallen leather satchel, his striped cardigan, and his unlocked phone, the first draft of an email lingering on its screen, to find Dully sleeping atop seven perfectly round pellets of his own shit. Then she lifted him into her arms and rushed to call the imam. He's on the run, the imam's second and most honest wife, Gulapa, informed Shakoko over the phone. Purportedly, a local squadron of T's intended to execute the imam for an old war crime he had not carried out during the initial stages of the American invasion in 2001. Gulapa went on to promise Shakoko that the, prom that the imam had promised her that a different squadron of T's had promised him that the whole situation would blow over before the Isha Salah. Inshallah, Shakoko said, and hung up her phone with a slight click, awakening Dali. <clears throat> Standing up at full length, Dali bared his fangs and lifted his arms and legs one at a time, as if to test them. Morning light fell upon him in slats, brightening his already luminous blonde fur. His heart thumped in his chest at such a rapid pace, he could feel the blood racing from its ventricles into his veins, each and every vein, which initially had been a terrifying, but quickly adjusting to its pace and force, he began to feel, oddly enough, healthy, exponentially healthy, or that is to say, 
healthier than he had felt in years. In fact, ever since the day he started his PhD in the History of Revolution program at UC Sacramento, Dully had become so fully immersed in the life of the mind, in reading, writing, research, analysis, references, notes, subnotes, emails, translations, and so on and so forth, that for large swaths of time, his body ceased to matter to him. His hair had been falling out. He had lost weight and muscle. His bones hurt all the time for no reason. But now, in his monkey's body, with his heart pumping wildly in his chest, he seemed calm, almost content. That was until he spoke. Where is my phone, Dully said, or thought he said, because all that came out of his mouth was an odd warbling noise. I've got class, he went on warbling. I must teach, I must. Horrified by his sudden inability to speak English with the eloquence he had so tirelessly developed over the course of grade school, middle school, high school, college, and the first three years of his PhD program, Dully shrieked, heard his own shrieking, frightened himself, and scurried off into the living room where his grandmother, Bibi Halima, and his father, Gran Gorzang, sat on a separate beige couches arguing in Pashto and Farsi about whether to watch Tolo or Lemar for the latest updates on the clashes in Logar. Gunfights between the T's and the government militias were supposed to have been intensifying, and both Bibi and Gran wished to see how close the fighting was to their old village. But in the midst of their ongoing argument, they stopped to watch a small, beautiful monkey leap onto their coffee table and begin to shriek with what sounded like a deeply philosophical desperation. Almost in unison, Gran and Bibi cocked back the personal remotes, each of them safeguarded like a favorite sword. But before they had a, tra before they had a chance to strike the monkey down, Shakako burst in, shouted three variations of the second name of Allah, and declared that the monkey before them was not just a monkey, but her son. First, Bibi asked, did he cross, cross the path of Yijan Imaz? Second, Gran added, did you call the Imam? Yes, Shakoko said to them both, slightly wheezing. You're always praying too late, Bibi scolded Shakoko in Farsi and went on to prophesy that Shakoko's habit of praying late and Dully's transformation into a monkey was just another sign of the fast approaching day of judgment. What did the Imam say? Gran asked in Pashto. According to his wife, Shakoko replied, Kadir is on the run. Which wife? The second one. That's the honest one, Gran said. I hope so, Shakuko replied. When is he supposed to return? A few hours, Shakuko said. She promised. Then it will be a day or two, Gran said, at least. A few hours later, the home phone rang. It was the old Imam Kadir. Thank you. Um, um, that was amazing, Jamil. Thank you. And uh, that is a story that I'm obsessed with also in, in this collection. And um, <laughs> uh, what amazed me about this particular story, and there's a few others like this, I'm thinking of um, Hungry Ricky Daddy, is um, how wildly and widely they range across time and locations, right? So like this story begins, you know, uh, in the US with this PhD student turning into a monkey and then ends up in Afghanistan with the monkey having a series of adventures, becoming like a squadron commander of some kind, you know, uh, also it's, it's, it just blew my mind. I loved it. But I'm wondering, did you plan that kind of range for a short story like this in advance or did it surprise you in the writing? And I'm just curious to hear about that process. Yeah, no, it, it totally surprised me. Um, you know, uh, with my stories, um, I always feel super fortunate when I can start a story like in one location and just keep all the characters in that location. Oftentimes when, you know, when my stories are going from, you know, Sacramento to Fremont to, to Kabul to Logad, it's because just the characters are getting out of hand and I'm trying to get, a, you know, I'm trying to get a handle on them, but they just want to, they just want to go all over the place. So with, uh, with the tale of Dolly's reversion in particular, you know, I submitted the first draft of that story in 2017 to a workshop at, at, uh, at the Iowa writers workshop. And it was, um, and it was 15 pages at the time. 
And um, and over the like, you know, the next five years, I think I wrote maybe maybe like 60 or 70 different drafts of that story. And, you know, some of them, I tried to keep them in West Sacramento in the house and just, you know, I think I was trying to do the sort of a, a metamorphosis thing and just let, you know, let Dully dwell on his transformation in the house and just sort of have this existential crisis. But, you know, it, it just felt like the characters really wanted to get out of the house and they wanted to head back to <laughs> Afghanistan. And, and you know, um, so you know, begrudgingly, I sort of just followed them there and and the story kept getting longer and longer. And so the I think the final draft ended up um, coming in at about like 60 or, or 70 pages. Um, and, uh, and so, and yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the stories, they, they oftentimes, they just sort of explode on me narratively and, um, and it's not something that I plan for. And, and, and it's, it's something that actually I try to contain, um, as much as I can, but, but sometimes, you know, it, it gets out of hand. Yeah. Don't contain it. It, it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, well, I, you know, since, um, this is a story about a monkey, right? And then you have um, a kind of slightly magic realist goats in another story, the parable of the goats. And yeah. in your first novel, um, the, it's a quest to find this, this sort of hideous missing dog in Logar. But I was yeah. wondering that the use of animals seems to have changed kind of significantly from that novel to this one. And I, again, and I'm, I'm curious to hear about um, the way in which you are deploying animals to kind of add a, another layer of reality to these stories. Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing. I had this moment um, during uh, during my during graduate school when I was at Davis, and I was taking these PhD courses. And um, and you know, up to then, I really I thought that the 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 central goal of my writing was to humanize my characters, right? And so that was what I was trying to do. I was humanized them. I wanted to complicate them. I wanted to make them seem like real people. But when I took some of these courses, they're like philosophical courses. Some of them are anthropology courses, and um, and they really like they 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 began to challenge my idea of what of what a human was and how much that like how, what we think of as a human, how much of that is actually based on, you know, like sort of the the philosophical tendency of. Of, of Western Europe or of Western civilization in general, and how you know there's th th this idea that 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 there's a certain universality to to all human beings can sort of um, it can be a it can be a way to to overlook like severe inequalities in in terms of like the the material experience of different people, and so um, and so you know when I include animals in my stories, I think it's oftentimes it's to explore this idea of of humanity of what makes a person a human or not. And, and so, you know, being able to, being able to turn a person into a monkey or into a goat, like it just, it becomes sort of, uh, it becomes my own way to sort of explore these questions. You know, I don't think I have anything um, particularly wise to say <laughs> about, you know, the notion of humanity, but, but my stories, they're, they're, they're a way, I think, to, to sort of explore these questions through, through the characters themselves. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, I think that's, that's one of the main reasons, that's one of the main things I try to explore with, um, with animals in my stories in particular. Yeah. And you know, that, that's, um, super interesting to hear about the, the sort of philosophical underpinning of it, because one thing I admired in this collection too, is how frequently you will actually bring in slightly academic text, uh, a character will be reading something or someone will give a speech that is recorded, right? Uh, Nabila, yeah. I think, gives a speech. I think if that's the character's name. Um, and that made me yeah. wonder about um, the particular diction that you employ in your stories. I mean, it seems to me like one of the signal innovations of your work that all these different registers can coexist. Um, yeah. And I know that wasn't always the case. I remember reading an article by you where you say you were trying to do this like very proper English and breaking that down into, yeah. into grammatical parts. How can you walk us through that transformation to the discovery of this particular voice that is so you? Yeah, you know, it, it's it started with with ninety nine nights in Logar. I would say, you know, I, I was at the time um, I was studying at UC Davis, um, and and I was reading I was reading writers like like Sandra Cisneros, um, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Dennis Johnson. 
Um, a lot of these, Barry Hanna, a lot of these writers with a very particular sort of stylized voice. And, um, and with, with writers like, like Sandra Cisneros in particular, um, they have, uh, you know, her, her use of, uh, of, of bilingualism in her, in her work as well. Like it was particularly um, inspirational for me. And so when I went into 99 Nights in Mogad, um, it was the first time that I was sort of, I felt, uh, I felt open to, to write this book and sort of this, this in this new language that was very, um, you know, that was very stylized and very particular to my own experience growing up as sort of, you know, as an as an Afghan American in in West Sacramento, California. And so, you know, I was incorporating Pashto, I was incorporating Farsi, I was incorporating Arabic, I was incorporating, um, you know, slang from West Sacramento. And so, and and that really that opened up that that novel to me, right? Like I couldn't have written that novel without finding that voice. Um, what's particularly great about the short stories is that um, is that I have to discover the voice all over again with each mm -hmm. of the stories, right? And mm -hmm. so in some of the stories, it's like it's sort of a similar Afghan American register. It's a, it's a mixture of different languages. It's, it incorporates like sort of youthful slang. Um, but then but then it's also very fun for me to sort of um, be able to write in a more of like, I don't know, like sort of a more of a uh, omniscient sort of a magical realist voice at times. Um, the haunting of Haji Hotuk was particularly fun for me to write because I was writing. Um, it was the first time like in a long time that I uh, that I was very purposely writing in sort of the register or the voice of like of like a white guy. And so I, I felt free to like you know, um, you know, explain things for the first time. I'm explaining mm. to my reader what, what, what Hajj is and I'm explaining to my reader what all these different things are. Cause I just, that's what I figured like a, a white guy would do when he's watching an Afghan American family go about their day. Right. And so, um, and so uh, figuring out the voice, it's, it's really crucial um, to, to the development of the story as a whole. And so with the, with the short story collection, I felt really freed up to, um, to explore these different voices in, in, in new ways. Yeah, and I and you know I I I love hearing about um, those kind of formal or voice breakthroughs. Um, you know, because again, I'm reminded of with 99 lights in Logar. I think you said that you were 100 pages in and you didn't know what to do, and you suddenly realized the characters could all tell their stories, right? That's right. And to yeah. become like an oral tradition. Here, um, I'm wondering which of the breakthroughs with the short stories surprised you the most. Like, was there a point at which? A story just opened up in a way that you hadn't expected. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm trying to think because the the haunting um, uh, of Haji Hotak and and playing playing Metal Gear Solid, those were really lovely experiences because the voice came to me very quickly and mm. I had it from the beginning mm. and then I just dived in and you know I wrote those stories within weeks which is like incredibly fast for me um oh no I don't think... tell us that that's so that's uh, <laughs> depressing to hear that you can write those amazing stories in a, in a few weeks <laughs> but but you know it's not it's not oftentimes the case like with <laughs> you know with the tale of Dully's reversion that took me that took me you know years to write and so like when I when I land upon a story that gets quickly sort of churned out like that's from that's like a really sort of a surreal almost like blessed experience that where I go through that you know I I will say with with the tale of of Dully's reversion again like that's a story that I struggled with so much and I think the breakthrough moment I had with that story is when I leaned into omniscience um, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in like in a way that I wasn't actually comfortable with at that time. You know, the initial the initial drafts of that story, they were very much um, the first draft was very centered on um, uh, a shakoko. It was uh, it was almost it was almost just entirely written in third person close um, zooming in on shakoko's perspective. The second draft um, I tried to focus. I tried to do it from Dully's perspective. Again, that didn't work. Um, th and that that wasn't the same. It was like the tenth draft or something like that that I finally landed upon that. And then and then I tried this thing where I was going back and forth between their perspectives. That didn't work. And it was only like maybe like thirty drafts in when I like when I really leaned into omniscience and I began to you know I, I began more I became more comfortable with incorporating Grand's. Um, perspective with incorporating BB's perspective with incorporating um, 
you know, all these different characters uh, going from one point of view to the next. Um, that's when that story really opened up for me. There's even, you know, I have passages where where I'm I'm throwing in historical texts. Um, one one of which is written by Winston Churchill, and <laughs> um, and so yeah, and so like when when I allowed myself to open up that voice and in, in that way, the perspective in that way, that's when that story finally came together for me. And it took such a long time. Yeah, that's amazing. I did notice that you you sort of do away with the sort of neat conventions of free and direct discourse or of like very close third person in many of the stories, mm -hmm. and it's very effective. Um, I also noticed when I was uh, reading the collection in the book form that a couple of the stories I think were slightly altered from the forms in which they appeared in magazines, like uh, the ending of Occupational Hazards yeah. is a little longer. And I was wondering if you can walk, uh, can talk, talk to us about what goes on between a story being in a magazine and coming into a book. Yeah, you know, so that's um, that was a story where I went back and forth on the ending um, quite a bit, you know, it was, uh, I, I'd submitted it to a workshop and they, they had really great comments about, about the ending of that story. Um, it, 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 initially in the first draft, it ends with sort of, um, you know, the, the main character, um, reading a passage from, from 99 Nights in Logar. And, and that's how the story ends. And, um, and I wrote that passage and it felt appropriate to a certain degree. Um, but at the same time, like, um, I, I, it felt like it, it recentered the, the, the son's story mm. in a way that, that didn't feel sort of natural to, to what I was trying to accomplish with that story. And, you know, I was worried, like, it felt a little bit like egotistical to me. And, 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 and so I had a lot of issues with that ending. And then, um, uh, and so, so for one draft, I just cut out that ending and I end mm. one, uh, like one page beforehand with the father uh, sort of dealing with his, with his pain and, and just try to move on with, with his life. Um, but when I came to, um, uh, when I submitted the story uh, to to the New Yorker and um, and the fiction editor there, editor there Deborah, um, she she we had a really great conversation about the ending and she liked she really liked what was happening with with that first ending that I wrote that ends mm. with with ninety nine nights in Logar, um, but but she was very receptive to my concerns as well and so we had sort of this um, you know we we came to this uh, 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 compromise where we would keep that section. But instead of emphasizing the novel, which I, I began to have all these issues with, uh, we focused more on on oral storytelling, and it and it became about um, the father telling his story instead of the father reading his story in a novel, and and that's that's when that's when the story really came together for me, and that was so that was like a really lovely editing experience overall mm. because I, I had so much trouble with the ending. I, I didn't want to cut it, but I but I kind of felt like I had to cut it. And um and so so I'm really grateful that we sort of came to that final compromise and and I'm very happy with the end, ending as it's written in in the New Yorker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. And um I uh you know I think it's no secret to say that a lot of the stories revolve around more or less one family, um, a missing um, brother from one of those families and um, that some of it is based off the life of your own family um, right. and you know you've written you've written I think at different points I've put this poor family through a lot I've turned them into video game characters and surveillance subjects <laughs> and monkeys and resumes um, <laughs> when I'm writing I feel alternatively like a thief a middleman and an informant uh, no shame in any of those professions let me just say uh, <laughs> but uh, what true. what's your what is um how do you balance that, the, the, the sort of exposure versus the desire to write? Well, it's difficult, right? You know, um, initially when I first began writing about my family stories, their, their, their personal histories, their, their memories, um, the things that they'd gone through uh, during, during the Soviet invasion, um, the, the bombings, the, the, the loved ones that they'd lost, their, their journey from, from Logar to, to Pakistan to the States, um, it, it was very, uh, you know, it was very anxiety inducing, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how my family exactly was going to respond to me, um, writing about their stories. Um, it was very important for me that, that I approached them, um, about the stories that I talked to them about what I was planning to do. You know, I wanted to be as sensitive to their feelings about the story as much as possible. You know, I had these very frank conversations with, 
with my mother and father and my and my siblings about what you know what I, what I plan to do with these stories. And um, and you know, alhamdulillah, they they were just they were exceedingly supportive. I'm not sure how um, how I would have responded if they hadn't been supportive. Mm -hmm. If they would have you know if they had taken you know it would have been their right to be like you know Jamil, please don't write about these stories. They they, they belong to us, right? If they'd been you know if they'd said something like that, you know I don't know. Uh, you, you know, I feel like I would have, I would have, I would have wanted to respect their wishes. I'm not sure I would have been able to write these stories, but, but they've been exceedingly supportive. And so, you know, when I go into these narratives, you know, some of them, some of them, I feel like very deeply belong to me. And then, and then some of them are, at the same time, I feel like are, are things that, 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 that on a deeper sense, like I can't really ever comprehend, like when it comes to, you know, the trauma of warfare or the trauma of having you know, cl close family members murdered um, in front of you. And so, and so, you know, for me, one of the things that, 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 that I then love about fiction writing is that when I'm approaching a topic that feels very raw or that feels incredibly vulnerable to me, um, fiction writing allows me to get at these topics, to get at these subjects in very different ways, right? So whether that's, you know, exploring, a relationship between a father and a son and the father's trauma through through a video game or or a resume or from turning you know the characters into <laughs> into monkeys or or or, or whatever else <laughs> or if i'm having a surveillance agent watch them you know it's it's just it's these different ways to try to get at the heart of these characters in, in a formal way that feels i don't know like they, I, I think it creates sort of this this safety net for me this this fictional barrier where by by distancing myself, um, I'm actually able to see the the characters and these stories in a in a in something like a, a, like a truer way. Like true true truer is not the right word, but it's it's something approaching that I think. Yeah, but which you know, but I I'm uh, I just want to add that you know the stories are tremendous fun and the characters do plenty of bad things too, right? They're, they're comical, yeah, yeah. they do bad things. So I mean that's <laughs> that's, right. that's always. And without that, they wouldn't be interesting stories. Like they would, yeah. you know, one, there's a lot of um, immigrant nostalgia fluff and your work is guilty <laughs> of none of that. So uh, thank you. I, I want, I'm, I just want, this is just an addition to the, to the, just a, uh, an adjunct to the stuff you said. I'm curious about that. Like, do you ever have to go back and say, oh, this character I've written based on someone I know is, is acting badly? Or do you kind of let, there's a stage at which you respect the, um, the pattern of the story. You know, I try to be, I try to be very careful about that, right? Like you're exactly right. You know, I want my characters uh, to, to behave badly at times. I want them to have sort of character flaws because then it, just as you say, right there, they wouldn't be interesting. And so, um, so, you know, I try to, I try to do things, you know, I, I, uh, what I'm most, what I'm often looking for in my characters is like, it's like contradictions, right? You know, mm -hmm. I want them to have sort of these virtues, um, balanced out by these very severe like character flaws right and and at times that can be sort of like an arduous process I I do get worried that like you know if someone if one of my family members is reading these stories and they <laughs> see themselves in the character like how they might respond to that um, one of the strategies that I use and I often talk to my students about is like um, you know if you if you're basing a character on on a real life person one of the things you can do is just to take those character traits or whatever else it is that that personal history and then and then just mix it up with with other people that you know and then you create sort of these frankenstein characters and then they have so many different traits and and personalities and and then and then and then the the, the person hopefully um you know won't won't be able to see themselves in the character will become this totally new person and so so there's strategies here and there i think you can use to um you know to sort of to sort of go over those those anxieties but um but yeah it's it's certainly a thing that i think about all the time and i've totally like i've cut out characters from my stories because they were just too close to you know someone that i knew and i was just like oh you know i don't want to i don't want to get a phone call one day and just like yeah <laughs> from an uncle <laughs> from an uncle or auntie right that's right that's right because uh, i love my uncles and aunties but you know <laughs> They can be bad sometimes. <laughs> the the other piece of advice I got is, you know, you can as long as you you can do whatever you want as long as you make them hot. You know, as long That's as they're attractive. Great. That's great. I love people that. Are, people are okay with that. it. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's great. I love that so much. I'm going to steal um, that. So, uh, you know, I think I have time for one more question for you and then we'll we'll um, switch over to the audience. But yeah. 
we've been talking a lot about stuff that you do write and that you do approach. And I'm, I want to hear about the things you choose not to write about. For example, a lot of the stories are animated by a missing person, right? There's Watak, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who appears, who yeah. appears as a kind of void that everyone is circling around. Um, yeah. that in Return to Sender, which was just amazing and, and devastating, um, there's Ismail, the son, who doesn't, who doesn't speak about his experience. Or there's Zarguna in, uh, again, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing, in another story oh, fine. who's, who's um, not there. Um, yeah. Why not enter, why do you choose not to enter the voices of those characters, especially Watak? You know, I think, I think it, it has a lot to do with the way that I've understood um, storytelling and, and family narratives from, from a very young age. You know, I think oftentimes um, people and, and households and even, you know, entire communities can be defined by, by their absences, right? And so, you know, in my household, that, that absence, it, it was always, it always was sort of, it, it was, it was Watuk, it was this, um, you know, it was this beloved uncle, this beloved brother, that that we'd lost a very long time ago and he died at a very young age um and yet you know his but his absence right this this this, this figure that existed in our house sort of uh, as a photograph it was such a large looming presence for me and in in a lot of our stories when i was growing up our most vulnerable our most beautiful stories they all circulated around the loss of these different of these different people, you know, whether it was my my father's brother or 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 my father's sister or, or my or my mother's brothers, um, you know, they they the 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 these absences loom so large in in my in my household and in the stories that we told that I think I just it, it, I think it very sort of naturally carried that into um, my my short stories. You know, when I'm when I was writing. Bakhtawara and, and Maryam, for example, you know, I, I I I hadn't even noticed that that there's this that there's this absence in the center of that story, or that in Return to Center again, there's this huge absence there. Like it, it just sort of it comes about naturally, and and it just makes sense to me that that there would be this this lost figure, and that everything in a way would revolve around them. And and, and I think it's it's one of the ways that I try to that I try to explore loss and and death and and mourning in my stories, and and I think that's why. You know, I sort of came upon the title, the the haunting of Haji Hotuk, because I think mm. just many of these stories are they're haunted by 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 these characters that are that are not actually like physically present within them. Mm, that's a that's a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, so we're at seven forty almost. I'm seeing if there's any questions. Lily, I believe, are you gonna take over in those questions? I'm also happy to keep, I have many questions for Jamil, so I can keep going till we get some from the audience. I think his audience members are supposed to post them. Yeah, I have a couple that came okay, through in the great. chat. Just Fantastic. a couple. So actually, why don't you ask one or two more questions and then I'll pop back in five minutes if that sounds good. Yeah, sure. Um, so the one one question that I had here on my list was, of course, about magic realism. It's 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 um, you know the, a, a lot this, these stories. You know, one of the pleasures of reading them was just being reminded of the kind of amazing explosion of energy that came from Salman Rushdie's early work, for example. Mm, I, yeah. I want to hear which magic realists you feel like you are in conversation with, who you've been reading, um, and how that's changing. Oh, you know, um, I, I think first and foremost, I have to mention um, uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He was really, uh, you know, the first magical realist that I'd come in contact with and someone, you know, the 100 years of solitude just it, it absolutely changed my life. It completely um, reconceptualized what I thought, you know, uh, a novel could accomplish in, in terms of uh, you know the the different genres it was interrogating the amount of characters in the novel the amount of generations and 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 what it did for you know my my conception of of, of Colombia you know that you know is this country that I wasn't very familiar with that by the end of that novel seemed to echo so many of the the different narratives or or, or feelings that I had about about, uh, you know, about Af Afghanistan. And so, the, you know, Marquez was very important. Um, I've read everything. I, I think I've read pretty much everything he's ever written. And then, and then, you know, once I, once I'd read Marquez, like, uh, I, I started to look at who, who he'd written. And so one of the writers that he mentions is, um, is Kafka, of course, and, and Metamorphosis. So that's another, 
So that's another short story I think I owe a lot to, especially the tale of Delhi's reversion, what what he what he accomplishes with with the fantastical elements in that story. I think I tried to, um, you know, if not if not outright steal, I tried to, I tried to like take little whispers or echoes from. And then um, Beloved by by Toni Morrison is another mm -hmm. that was a very important novel. I had I had this um, I had this uh, year year long span where I read I think I read. Um, uh, uh, Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, um, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and Beloved by Toni Morrison, back to back to back. And th there was these three novels that like, they, they <laughs> all three of them really transformed me. They're very transformative novels in different ways. And like, since then, like, I think, I, I feel like, uh, like reading those novels back to back to back, like it really, um, I, I think like it was almost too much, uh, like, <laughs> like wonderful, incredible literature. Like it sort of exploded my head in a way that I haven't been able to recover from. And so, so I, I would say, you know, I, I, I owe a lot to those novels and, and what they're, you know, the, the, the objectives of their magical realism in terms of exploring different political or or historical or or ideological issues you know when when I when I you know the when, when I started the story the tale of Dolly's reversion there was actually like at the time there was a tweet that had gone viral about it was like making fun of like the the it, what had become a cliche at the time of like a character just turning into a bird and and it was all over the place and it made me totally worried about my story like oh <laughs> shit can we not is it, are we not allowed to turn characters into animals anymore because it's become sort of like this kind of like orientalist cliche that you see in like sort of immigrant literature um but but you know i i, I kept i kept thinking about it and you know it was it was rooted in this in this old story that I'd heard from my grandmother, and I was like, you know, what the hell? Like, I'm just I'm just gonna do it. And then, you know, if they tear it apart, that's 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 fine. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, it's Lily. I don't know if Lily's coming on. So Lily, do you want to take over now? Yeah, I think that's actually a great place to move into audience questions. Um, one of the questions I had gotten in the chat was actually about what books you read while you were working on this. So you've answered that already. Um, but there's also a question in the Q&A uh, from Fatima. It says, I love the inclusion of Islamic folklore and urban legend in your work. Do you have a particular approach to that? And has it changed over time? Oh, that's a, that's a great, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I would say you know the the Islamic folklore, the the narratives from 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 the Quran and and the Hadith, like those were those are some of the first stories that I'd ever been told, right? So, but in in terms of like you know from a very young age when I was beginning to conceptualize like like what a story is is supposed to accomplish, what a story can do, like those stories were always there for me, and you know, and it's funny because. Like when I was <laughs> when I was very young, I think like many people, um, when it when it comes to sort of like you know either biblical tales or Quranic tales, uh, I took those stories for granted. You know they were they were totally boring to me, and I, I didn't want to hear about them. And so and so it did it like it took some time for me to to return to them many years later and to to sort of to sort of understand um, the the beauty of those stories and what what I could take away from those narratives in my own work and how. And how like uh, you know how how many of my how many of my stories and my understanding of like um, you know of not necessarily the, the supernatural but 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 something beyond the real I would say you know uh, uh, I'm, I'm a practicing Muslim I, my entire life I'd grown up with these stories of of uh, of angels and and jinn and and it's something that I that I that I very much believe in you know not not as something like metaphorical but as but as like the, this reality beyond reality and so mm -hmm. when i'm thinking about magical realism for example and and how far i can i can push my stories in terms of um their relationship to to reality or or the material world or whatever else it is like that that really does i think that plays into it in a way that um in the way that i think is it's it's very foundational and it's almost difficult um to to describe yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I read a lot of magical realism as well. And to hear you speak about it from an Islamic point of view is absolutely fascinating. So thank you. Um, 
a question from another another audience member about process. Um, so you mentioned yeah. Jamila that one of your for one of your works you submitted it to a workshop, and they want to know: Do you go to workshop often? Do you mostly work with beta readers and editors, or is it a combination of both? Um, and I would just tack on to that because I'm always curious: like, who is the first person who reads your work when it's when it's drafted? Yeah, um, yeah, excellent, excellent questions. I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm entering sort of a, a brave new world for me. Like this is actually going to be the first time in a long time that I'm going to be writing fiction without the the structure of the workshop. Like I think in a lot of ways, like I was as a fiction writer, um, I was uh, I was raised within the workshop. I did my first workshop when I was when I was 18 years old, my first year of college um, in in 2010, and and since then I'd I'd done I, I'd been in a workshop almost every single semester up until like right now because I, I went from Sac State for four years and then I was at Davis for two years and then I was at I took a year long break and then I was at Iowa for two years and then I went straight from Iowa into um, into the Stegner program and so I've you know I, I really like um, I, I feel like in a certain like I'm actually really worried that that my stories are actually kind of dependent upon um, the workshop format I've just I've always found it um, really, really productive in terms of like the deadlines and always having this this group of really brilliant writers to be able to get critique from. So, so we'll see what happens. You know, I, I, I've been really indebted to the workshop structure. I know there's a lot of issues with the workshop, and you know, I personally, I've also had issues with the workshop. It's something that I've tried to try to challenge and, and develop in my own classes. Um, but, but I, but I do, I, you know, I have to admit, I owe a lot to the workshop as, as a, uh, as sort of this, um, as the structural model, uh, for how I go about writing stories. So, um, so we'll see what happens, you know, and now that, now that I don't have, uh, that I won't have as many workshops, my, my first reader tends to be, uh, my siblings are, they're, they're the first person, they're the first people I send my stories to. I have a group chat and, um, you know, they, oftentimes they know, like all of my inside jokes and my stories, and then they know who who the characters are based on. They know what what memories I'm drawing from, and they're very, um, you know, my my brothers and sisters. They they don't hold back either. They're very honest readers, and they can <laughs> they can really tear a story apart when um when when they when they have issues with it. And so so those are the first people that I said my stories to. And I think in a lot of ways, my my siblings are are the people who who I write my stories for. And so. Um, you know, uh, I, I, you know, there's also writers that I know that that I'll try to get um, feedback from on occasion, but um, and then and then my my agent and my editors, of course, but um, but but my, but my siblings, they they still they still come first. I love that idea of siblings as your first readers, because I I can't imagine that they would not pull their punches. Um, exactly. And for the That's exactly right. <laughs> Um, a follow-up question to that from Michelle and Karin. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this actually as well. So Michelle says, thank you for this wonderful conversation and wanted to ask a question about assessing your own writing for writers who are not enrolled in an MFA, may not have workshop training. Um, so for writers that want to write outside of Western considerations of what is good in quotes, um, do you have thoughts on a writer, how a writer understands if you've crafted stories that are compelling and well done, but how to figure that out outside of a traditional writing program? How do you develop those muscles that those tools to be able to assess your own work? That's, um, you know, I, I think that's such a great, um, important question. Um, you know, I've been I've been very, you know, as I mentioned, I've been very indebted to the the workshop as as sort of this this teaching model, um, and then and that, but then at the same time, I've also like I've been very indebted to particular craft books as well. And so one of the things I would say that you know if you if you you know if you're not enrolled in an MFA or if you don't have formal training in in creative writing, I I would say like and this is something that I recommend to my students that I do think it's sort of then important. To, to get your hands on sort of some of like the, the foundational um, craft textbooks, you know, the, the, the Art of Fiction by, by John Gardner, for example, or, or I think Writing Fiction by Janet Burroway is a great one. And then, um, you, you know, there the, the, the are particular craft books for, for sentence writing and for, you know, the use of time. And I found those all invaluable with the, you know, with the, with the, um, with, with the, with the sort of the, the context that 
um, it was also very important for me then to to be able to write beyond those craft books as well. You know, when I read I read the art of fiction when I was very young, and I was very committed to to John Gardner's particular. It's it's a very traditional conception of of like what a short story or what a story is supposed to do, and and so an important process, important stage in my development in as a writer was was to begin to move beyond that, right? So I do think I do think there are these foundational texts that that are important to read, but then but then are also important to sort of like grow past or or to deconstruct at a certain point as well. And you know, there's a lot of really great um uh, craft books that are coming out now that are looking at fiction writing or creative writing beyond sort of this this singular Western or or American lens, and and those I think those are going to be very very crucial for you know a, 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 a future generation of writers or even you know a current generation of writers. So um, yeah, I think I think craft books, and then and then and then you know the other question about like when. When, when I know like, or how I understand, like being able to assess my own writing, that's that's always sort of a, a very mysterious process. And, uh, but but I'd love to hear from Karan. Oh, I mean, um, your answer is great. I'll just add to that. I think it can be useful to square with yourself about whether you've managed to say the things you set out to say. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you get a real feeling when that actually happens. And also whether you've made a couple of discoveries, at least in the writing. Uh, often, you know, then after that, it, a lot of it is just semantics or improving sentences or deleting things. But if that core exists, I think you're, you're a lot closer to knowing to being done. Mm. Yeah. Just in terms of craft books really quickly, I want to shout out Matthew Salesis's Craft in the Real World, which is this incredible yes. book about craft writing workshops from a non-white, non-New you know Eurocentric Eurocentric point of view, which is incredible. Um, another question from the audience from Anilo, which I'm gonna sort of summarize um, about research and how you take notes when you are preparing details to go into your stories. Like how do you remember, keep track of all of the, the character names, the, the actions in, in your work? You know, so this is this is why, like, I sometimes I'll describe like I feel like a spy at times because, like, you know, I'll be I'll be at my house and and you know I'm I'm just I'm very very fortunate because I I come from a household just chock full of these really beautiful stories and these really remarkable storytellers. Like like I sort of got everyone in my family, my mother, my father, my my grandmother, God rest her soul, my my aunt. Um, they're, they're all so much, there's so, such, there's such better storytellers than I am myself. So, you know, when, and it's so, you know, when I'm at home and I'm thinking through a story and then, and then I begin to hear another story, like my father starts telling a story from the war or my mother starts telling a story of her travel through, through the mountains into Pakistan or, or, or whatever else it might be. Like I, I will, like, I'll literally, I'll take out my phone and I'm listening to them and I'm riveted. At the same time, I'm also like taking notes secretly or, or sometimes, sometimes I'll just um, I'll open up my my recording app and I'll just I'll just click on the recording. And and because I don't want to like this is the thing is like I don't want to interrupt them and be like, hey, I'm, I'm recording you um, like keep keep going because uh, it'll, it'll mess up the flow of the story. Like I think a story, especially like a story that comes about an oral story that comes about very organically in the midst of a conversation, like it's such a delicate beautiful thing and as much as possible like when I'm when I'm writing notes about a story and trying to remember details of a story like I try to like not interrupt it and so and so you know so I'll just start recording secretly um and 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 then afterwards I'll I'll try to you know I'll talk to them about it and be like okay you know I I was recording you the whole time so I hope that's okay <laughs> and um and then and then you know yeah it's it's totally it's 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 a lot of it's a lot of taking notes I owe a lot to my notes app and then, um, and then, you know, also my, my recording app, these apps have been very helpful. <laughs> I love the idea of recording conversations because I can imagine that really helps you get like the rhythm of the voice as well. To yes. Because amazing. Um, totally. I'm, I'm conscious of our time. So I'm going to do 
one more question from our audience and then Karen actually wanted to make sure that you got the last question of the night if you have one um that one more question from the audience this is from Kristen um his question their question excuse me refers to the mention of having to step away from the characters a bit in order to find the truer story is time a factor into figuring out that distance is needed? Sometimes there's the story the author wants to tell, and then the story we sense the world requires, and that space and time. Um, and does that play into this trueness in in quotes? Oh yes, ab absolutely. You know, I think that's like that's really that's really um, you know introspective. I think that's like that's a really that's a really great question because yeah, it, uh, for me at least, it plays it plays a really really huge uh, role in, in how I'm understanding my characters and how I'm understanding the story as a whole. Um, when I was back at Davis, uh, Zadie Smith came by to do to give this like really big um, lecture in front of like this huge audience. And um, but but she took the time out of her day to sit with um, like a creative writing class, a creative writing cohort. And one of the things that she mentioned um was uh and it stuck with me till this day because like i i disagreed initially like like a, like a total dumbass and she said like that style is completely rooted in in the writer's relationship to time and i was like and I, at the time I, I you know i'm like i'm like i'm like 22 years old i'm like that's not that's not, that's not true styles all these different sorts of things but the more i thought about that you know in the years to come the more the more truer it actually it, it actually seemed to me and so you know when when i'm thinking through a story it's you know it's not just in terms of like diction or or character relationships or or the particular form but i think you know time plays such a huge role in that whether i want to you know go whether i'm exploring a story that's that's very much rooted in the past whether i'm you know the whether i decide to have the story told by another story by another character within the story and and what that does to time how that you know um sort of reconfigures the the relationship to time and, and the characters within the story or or on on the other hand um if i if i decide to write a story in the present tense like like what that does to to the rhythm uh and the and the momentum of the story as well so yeah time time is always a huge factor amazing i love this second hand zadie smith Girl of wisdom, thank you. Um, Karen, as I said, before I close us out with thanks at, for the end of our night, I do want to give you the last question. Thank you, Lily. Um, uh, I was, you know, Jimmy, you and I have had conversations about place. And one thing that has in, interested me and impressed me is that you, base, you, you sort of have a feeling that you want to be back in Sacramento and that's where you are. That's where you've done some of your best writing. Can you explain what role this particular city, I mean, Logar obviously occupies a place in your imagination, but what does this city, not just the house that you're in with your parents and your siblings, what does it do for you as a writer? Yeah. And why is it important to be there for you? Well, yeah, that's funny. It's, it's a city that I really took for granted for much of my life. You know, I just, I just, it didn't seem, Sacramento didn't seem like a literary location to me. And for much of my life, I'd been, I'd been so, um, you know, inundated with these stories of of Logar. You know, all of our stories in my household began and ended with Logar. It was it was really sort of the, the root of like my my like mm. narrative or literary imagination. And then when I'd gone back and I'd visited the country, like I had such an incredible overwhelming time there and I loved it so much that that when I got back to Sacramento, all I wanted to write about was Logar. Like and and this continued for many years. Um, until I until I finally left Sacramento and you know when I went to Iowa um, that was that was the first time you know I'd actually moved out of out of the Sacramento region it was the first time that I uh, that I was like you know um, uh, 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 thousands of miles away from from my family members it was the first time I was away from my community it was the first time I was away from my local mosque that um, that if I finally, you know, it was it was in Iowa, feeling totally homesick. That I that I finally had this urge to to write about Sacramento and and Davis and 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 that sort of that region for the first time. And um and you know it was uh, it was literally like I think my first month in Iowa, I was totally depressed, and it, it was snowing, and it was the first time I was living through snow. And and that was when I wrote Hungry Ricky Daddy, which is the first story that I'd ever <laughs> written that was set in like the Sacramento Davis region. And so, so you know, it was just I think it like it was rooted 
like I was, I miss Sacramento so much that I, I, I wanted to be back there. And so I was returning to the place in my stories. And so that was the first time that like, you know, I really began to understand um, how much Sacramento played a role in, 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 in sort of this, it, it became a much more complex place to me. I sort of began to, um, I began to like study it more often. I began to look into it in terms of its, of its political history, its geographic history, that all these different things. And, 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 and that's when Sacramento really opened up to me. And now, and now my stories that are set in Sacramento are, are some of my favorites. So. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Jamil. Thanks for the, the great answers, the great reading. And everyone should buy Jamil's new book. What There's the cover link. looks like so you can find it in bookstores. Please do go buy a copy. Um, it's my, I get the, the pleasure of closing us out with thanks for the evening. Um, thank you, Jamil, for this work, for your this conversation. Thank you, Karin, for guiding us through it as well. Um, so grateful to have both of you on our Zoom, and we really hope to be able to welcome you to the workshop in person at some point in the future, and that everyone stays healthy and safe in the meantime. Um, I want to make sure, as always, to thank the incredible folks from Pro Bono ASL, um, our interpreter Susan, who is on screen right now, and Jordan, who was on screen earlier. Um, Pro Bono ASL is an amazing organization. They do absolutely fantastic work, and it's always a pleasure to work with them. So please do check them out. Um, and thank you so much. Again, the workshop will be online for a couple of different events this week. You can always check that out on our website or our social media. Um, and yeah, again, we hope to see everyone in New York City as soon as is safely possible. So uh, take very good care, everyone. Thank you both so much again. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, this was absolutely wonderful. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Take care and congratulations again, Daniel.